quite a bit without code there is still space for for the nerds or the coders uh, to be effective in the in the platform um, Raz, I think, uh, and Danish, I think you already played the video from the folks at the uh, Microsoft product team around uh, PCF and, and ProDev uh, strategies. Um, Microsoft has reinforced that they are not done with us. <laughs> in fact, there is a lot of investment in making our lives easier uh, in providing us better tools to, to do what we do. So there is there is space in the industry for us. Today, what I will talk about is essentially uh, liquid developments for, for portals uh, professionals. So we're going to have a look at the language itself. Uh, it's going to feel a lot like a, uh, a programming uh, a logic course. So we're going to look at uh, operators and we're going to look at the, the details in the language. And then at the end, we're going to have a demo on um, how you can Put together everything that we learned today. Um, I don't want to uh, be over optimistic. I think you know one hour is, is is not enough time for us to really really dig deep into it. But uh, I mean, I have this as an introduction to to Liquid and my contact and the contact for other folks in the industry will be available uh, throughout the session. And you can always reach out to us for more questions. All right. Uh, without further ado, let me put my Slide deck up. And uh, let me know when you see it. Oops, wrong screen. Sorry, folks. All right, if you can see it, please uh, give a shout or let me know that you can see my screen. Yeah, there that's we go. Great. All right, so again, my name is Victor Dantas. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm also, I take a lot of pride in being a uh, 365 Saturday ambassador. Uh, and uh, we can call it now the power community. Uh, I take a lot of pride in being one of the ambassadors. Uh, I am a, also a Microsoft Community so, uh, Solutions Architect and um, power, power Platform Consultant. If you want to have access to my profile on LinkedIn, you can just scan the QR code. And uh, there you have it. All right, so the objects of the session today, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to build some solid liquid skills, understand the technology, programming capabilities in uh, Power Apps portals. We're going to establish good practices. Uh, I know that uh, there is another guy, I think his name is Arpit, he's going to be doing another session on portals uh, as well this weekend. So I believe he's going to extend a little bit more on uh, good practices. And if time allows, we're going to have a view of the future in, uh, in, um, in Power Apps portals. I hope your, your meal there, I think it's Juka. I hope your meal look, uh, is good. <laughs> All right. Um, again, the agenda, we're going to have a look now at Power, uh, Power Apps portals under the hood. Um, uh, what it is, a web template within portals, liquid. Um, liquid.net, uh, then tags, operators, types, portal objects, and filters, and then a common usage of them all together. All right, under the hood, Power Apps Portal was originally built using ASP.net. Uh, the, the last version that we have access to is the community version edition. I think it's um, version 8.3. Uh, of portals. Portals now on 9.2. So the latest code that we have available was built on uh, .NET Framework 4.7, but I don't know what is available today on the Power Apps portals because we don't have access to code. But I can tell you for certain that it's still a .NET based technology. All right. And at the time that we had access to the source code, Power Apps Portals was uh, built to using forms, ASP.NET forms and uh, ASP.NET MVC. Uh, Portals today is built using Bootstrap 
uh, 3.7, so we are not yet on Bootstrap 4. Okay, and uh, it uses jQuery um, already embedded on it. All right. So before we move uh, further, I think it's important for us to understand how this thing is wired. Um, again, Portal, as we just look at, uses .NET technology, but uh, Portal is a combination of the binaries, uh, if you will, as well as data. So at any given Power Apps Portal, you see these entities available as soon as we, you install it. Today, we're not gonna look at how to provision portals. I have videos uh, online and there are other folks who have published around step-by-step uh, -step instruction on um, how to provision one. But as soon as you provision, this is what you see in your dynamics uh, as um, additional entities to to your uh, CDS, if you will, CDS uh, database. So you're gonna have websites. Websites are related, uh, have uh, related entities to it, web pages, site settings, content snippets, web files. Then web pages have web page localized content. This is to facilitate multi-language setup. Then uh, pages use page templates. Again, when um, the original version of portals and still to this day, uh, page templates are uh, the way for you to pretty much design your page around, how you expose both data and the structure of the page itself. It used to allow us to, to add uh, .NET pages um, to it, uh, today we can all use uh, liquid and web templates and that's that's the focus of this session. Um, following that, attached to a page, you can have entity forms, entity views. There's one other entity that I didn't put there, but it's also available called web forms. And then a page template, as just mentioned, can be of two types. It can be a rewrite page template, which points to an ASP.NET page. Uh, that would be an ASPX page, and then web templates. Again, because we cannot add uh, any more files to, to the final binary on Power Apps portals, we can't really extend portals much using the strategy of um, ASP.NET pages. So the only thing we can really use is web templates. And then uh, breaking out a bit on web templates, you have um, what can be actually uh, use or the technologies that can, you can use to extend a uh, page on the portal is uh, HTML, JavaScript, and Liquid. Um, so the focus of the session is Liquid. So before we jump in looking to code, I want to break down a little bit more uh, and explain a little bit more on the web templates uh, entity and uh, the data structure. All right, so let's let's have a look at that real quick, and then we'll come back to the slide that shortly here. So, when you when you add a portal, provision a portal to your CDS, you're gonna get two apps in your apps list. The first one will be the portal itself, and you have this icon that makes a reference to it, the little circle representing the web, and then you have a portal management, which is a model-driven app pointing to your um, CDS. So if I click to open it, the first view of the of the uh, management, portal management model-driven app is this. So it's going to list your website if I were to open here, you'd see pages, you'd see content snippets, site settings, web link sets for the menu, site markers, page templates, so on and so forth. As just mentioned uh, on the on the slide deck. If I skip all the way down to web templates, you see a list of things that were already pre-built uh, and, and available. Um, when you started uh, installed portals. If I click to add a new web template, you see the main fields for the template. The name, 
the website that uses it. As you maybe uh, maybe know already, you can have multiple websites attached to one single instance of CDS. You have the source of your template. Again, this can be um, HTML. It also includes scripting, JavaScript. And the good thing with this editor is that you get a little bit of IntelliSense on the editor uh, already. And then uh, there is a field here called MIME type. If you leave this blank, your pages will always be rendered as um, HTML. But you can also fill that in and provide different MIME types to your page. And what that facilitates us, uh, the, the, this comes handy is essentially if you want to create a web template that spits out different content than HTML. So, for example, if you want to spit out um, XML, if you want to spit out JSON, you can use the MIME type for that matter. In fact, we're going to look at an example that, that does that. All right. So let's hop back to the slide deck. So a little bit on Liquid. Uh, Liquid is uh, was created by a, by a company, a Canadian company called Shopify. Uh, they have uh, e-commerce uh, technology. So when um, ADX was rethinking the strategy around web templates, mostly to facilitate SaaS offering of uh, ADX portals, they decided to use Liquid to be this uh, template uh, server side language to be used. Um, so instead of you uploading different files to your um, to your portal offering, you'd be able to quickly make changes to an existing template using Liquid. Um, the offset of that language that was used for portals called Liquid.net, and and again, it's a .NET based uh, version of Liquid. Uh, there are discrepancies between the two versions and we'll look at it uh the ones that i've i've found uh throughout my career now there are it's not very many but uh, know that there are different um versions if you will or different functionality between the two languages and then uh finally the, here's a link to the power apps portals documentation uh the the page itself i find it very useful there is quite a bit there. Uh, sometimes it can be overwhelming for you to consume it all in one run, but there is quite a bit. So I would strongly recommend you to refer to it. It's not like a, a wiki page or a help page where you can click and, and navigate and see a whole lot of samples, especially on the, the heavily used stuff, but it, it's a good starting point. And a lot of what you're going to see in this demo is a reference to what's available in the documentation. Um, I should mention this also, if there is anything that you find on your own uh, uh, journey and you don't see on the documents page, let me know. Um, there is a professional, uh, I forgot his last name, uh, I think his first name is Nikita, that's also available on LinkedIn, he's a Microsoft uh, employee. So he he oversees the fast track team for portals and he's always open to suggestions on how we can make the page um, better um, this documentation page better and more useful all right so um when we first look at liquid uh this is essentially um what you're gonna find um, there liquid is composed by tags and uh, uh, flow instructions, uh, control flow, iteration inner flow, structures, objects, and filters. Um, this is what you're gonna see when you, you when you look at it at first. This will remind you if you have uh, been a coder for for long. This will remind you of um, ASP.NET Razor, MVC Razor. Um, uh, where you see 
a mix of uh, tags that are mostly uh, server based and then HTML content embedded to it. That's essentially what uh, a template language uh, does uh, for us, or allows us to do basically uh, mix and match server instruction, if you will, and uh, content all in the same um, in the same piece of code. If you haven't, if you have used classic ASP, um, you see that as well. Um, a lot of uh, you know server side tags and then HTML tags and JavaScript all in the same place. Uh, you may think, oh, this is confusing. It's a mess. I mean, this is what's being used today. I, I can't really advocate if it's the best scenario, but uh, uh, what I can tell you is that being a template language, I think Liquid really fits the bill for what it's attempting to do. And what we're gonna see today is that a lot of the functionality that Liquid provides actually makes our life much easy, um, it very easy um, when it comes to placing controls and placing HTML content around the page, all right? So the basic uh, operators to Liquid are similar to what you see even in, um, in C Sharp equals equals uh, exclamation mark equals for different greater than less than etc but then uh, some of the other operators are not as uh, similar so the end uh, operator if you will it's more a verb uh, verbose uh, instead of the uh, uh, the and and or the the pipe pipe for or uh, you have other operators for contains um, you have start with, ends with, again, uh, stuff that you could do differently in C-sharp, but this, in my opinion, is, is easier to use than what you'd see in C-sharp. Uh, you have size. Uh, size is a very gener uh, generic operator, if you will. Um, it acts more like a, a method or function. Uh, it's similar to count um, in C-sharp, and it can be used for strings. It can be used for uh, collections, so on and so forth. Um, one thing that's uh, very interesting about um, Liquid is how it processes uh, empty strings or a uh, empty array or a no object or false uh, Boolean value or even uh, uh, checking the size of a collection. If you set up an if statement and you comp and if you say, for example, if my collection and you don't provide any other operator, it will assume that you are testing the size or the contents, contents of your collection, whether your collection doesn't have items or whether your collection is no. Again, we, we're going to look at code and do you understand what I mean? And then finally, there is one particular um, control flow that's called unless, which is revert an if statement. And, and again, we're going to have a look at that shortly here. All right, so let's let's jump right into Liquid and uh, let's look at some examples. Again, like I said in the beginning, this will feel a lot like a uh, logic uh, college class, but um, I think there is value in um, looking at the language with um, having that perspective. So this is a template I created called Hello World. And what I will do is I'm going to open the portal on another window and we're going to look at the output of this particular instructions that we're going to see on Liquid. So give me a moment here to connect, to open the portal, and we're going to dive right in. So let me try to overlay one window against the other, and we'll try to do it side by side. All right, 
So cool, I'm logged on to the portal using an admin credential. Again, uh, the purpose of the training is not really to teach you how to set up a portal, how to use admin accounts. We can do that at another time, but to show Liquid itself. So I'm logged in as admin and you know that, note here that I have opened this particular page on the score service not about. And the reason being is because as I make some changes to my code here, I'm gonna clear the cache so that I can see the result on my page. Uh, web templates are not part of the cache today, so changes to web templates would require us to make a, to, to clear the cache to see the result right away. So the first step you see here is a comment. Uh, we don't use, uh, you know, backslash backslash to, to comment code. You have to use the tag. You see comment and then end comment right here at the bottom to close my comments. I have provided this code snippets ahead of time and tested so that we don't have any surprises. So what I do first is I'm going to show, um, to display this particular if statement. So here, what I'm testing is if the user is logged on, which means that this user object is not null, that's what this particular if statement is doing, I can then access properties of my user object. All right, so let me save and then come back here and clear the cache. So hello, and then uh, the user that I'm, that I'm logged on with is called Antonio Dantas. That's his name. So quick thing on the structure of, uh, of uh, Liquid. The curly uh, brackets and percent sign indicates that I have a tag. My tag can be a control flow a, or an interaction, uh, interaction flow or a tag. We're going to look at different tags here shortly. And then... Uh, I start putting HTML content right after, and then I use double curly brackets. This is to, this is to indicate that I, I want to print a value out uh, from Liquid or from server side to, uh, to my HTML. And then the pipe indicates that I'm going to use a filter. Filters in Liquid uh, will resemble functions a lot of times. And in this case, my function is upcase. So I'm just making the results uppercase. All right. So let's have a look at another instruction here. So in this particular one, it's this, um, this control flow is called unless. And unless will work in the opposite way as an if statement. All right, so this particular HTML block will only be printed if the full name does not contain Dantas. So in this scenario, I don't get anything, but if I were to get this link and open another browser window in which I'm not logged in, I would see the hello world message and I would see that particular div. So fairly straightforward, and again, the unless it will do the opposite of what an if statement would look like. So quickly jump back to the slide. Let's have a look at data types. So Liquid has string, number, a Boolean, array, dictionary, date, time, and then the no comparison. Um, string, very straightforward. Um, number, you don't really get to define what type of number that you are um, declaring to be used, but you can use filters uh, when you want to present that number. For example, if I, if I declare a variable and assign a decimal value to my variable, I can then expose that variable in my template as an integer. And we're going to look at that when we look at uh, liquid filters. Booleans, true, false, yes, no, 
um, I think enable is disable is also considered to be a boolean in that uh, fashion. You can have arrays, you can have dictionary, uh, date time, and again, the null comparison that we just looked at in the beginning, where null can also mean zero, false, uh, collection without items, a string that's empty. All right, so it, it treats that particular comparison the same way. All right, so let's have a look at types. In my example, I have some types here. I'm going to put my comment. I'm just going to remove this tag for a minute. Uh, actually, let's leave it here so that it will make a whole lot of confusion. So let's have a look first at how I can declare a variable um, and then a variable types. All right. First of all, you have this assign uh, tag. Assign will not only create the variable, but assign value to it. So suppose that my full variable um, is declared up top here, and I want to also change the value based on an if statement. If I want to do that, the instruction for changing the value is also assigned. Okay, so if I want to make this full bar, along the progress of my script, I also use a sign. There is no full equals to. It just doesn't work. Your script will fail. So you have to reuse a sign. Okay, it's not as if it's declaring the variable again. In this scenario, it's just reassign a value to it. If you want to append to your variable, then you would use a filter for that. So append test. So that's that there. Uh, there's also another way to assign or create a variable, and that's using capture. Capture comes in handy when your contents or the contents of your variable use, uh, you know, special characters or if, if it's a multi-line particular scenario. So within this particular structure between capture and then capture, wherever it's put into this block becomes the contents of your variable. And then in the following line, what I'm doing here is I'm printing out my variable and then I'm replacing the new line character that we don't see here. I'm replacing that with HTML BR. All right. Okay. In strings. So when I'm declaring a string, I may or may not use quotes and uh, it works uh, either way so with quotes without uh, quotes it does work so you get to go there then uh, the instruction here is to print those two variables then if I'm using a number like I said shortly here I can declare my number as an integer or a decimal and then I can use filters to decide how to print um, in the beginning, I talked about filters or the, the discrepancies between the .NET uh, version of Liquid and the original version of Liquid. If you look for a filter called integer in the original Liquid language, the one from Shopify, uh, you don't find it. I couldn't find any. Uh, same thing for decimal. So this is special case for the .NET version that we use. If I want to round a number, I can use round, which is a filter, and this and tell the number of decimal places. So let me save this guy here. Clear the cache. Go back to my page, and we would see the end results here. All right, that's bar for my variable that I printed way up here. That I'm being captured. You see how it replaced with BR. If we were to inspect, we'd see the BR instruction, instruction here. Then I have my strings and then numbers. So I printed my numbers. You see the difference between them. Three, three. So floor, we rounded uh, the the decimal number. Floor, then integer does performs the same functionality in SS decimal just reprints the value of my variable. And if I want to round, so it just rounded 
pi to uh, three um, numbers, three decimal numbers. All right. So moving on, let's have a look at dates. And that's another thing that's different between the original liquid language and uh, the .NET version of it. The, the .NET version of Liquid uses the format string based on what you see in .NET. If you try to, if you see examples in the Liquid documentation from Shopify, you see that this format is a lot different than um, what the Microsoft documentation talk about. So, save time for you. If you're looking for a particular format, look for it in .NET and then you can replace the string here. Don't use the Liquid version. All right, so there you have it. I have an object called page, which is the page that I'm on. When it was last modified, then I print that here. And then I have the now uh, function or object, if you will. And then I'm formatting a bit different and then printing that on my screen. Comment, let's throw that in here. And then you have a race. I created this particular race with string options. And then I do a split, which again is a liquid filter. Anything you see after the pipe is a filter. Um, then I break out that array and I'm iterating through that array. Uh, so you have a four speaker, oh, very simple instruction. One cool thing about liquid is this though. If you do not want to test the size of your array and you wanted to provide a specific message when the array is empty, you can do this. So in other languages, sorry, I don't have to write this now. So in other languages, you'd have to do an if statement to test the size of your array before iterating through to provide that message. Liquid provides this else. Um, control flow within a for loop. There is no uh, while loop um, in Liquid, so whatever you need to do that you need while, you have to figure out a way to use a for uh, for that. Um, Liquid also has dictionaries, so you can look at the parameter collection within the request and print that. So let's save and see the results. Sorry, forgot to clear the cache. Uh, I guess I lied. So that's a difference here too. This is completely possible on the regular liquid. So let's go back here, clear cache. All right, here's my array and the dictionary has 94 parameters. All right, so far so good. Hopping back to the presentation real quick. Let's see where we are at. So we we looked at some uh, control flow liquid tags. If and last case when, we're gonna have a look at case one actually. Uh, we're gonna have a look at the iteration flow, for loops, table row, and uh, we're gonna see a particular thing about table row. Uh, templates, um, um, tags, fetch XML includes blocks, so on and so forth, and then finally CDS entity tags. All right. So for that, a, I have a template here called liquid tags, and I'm going to navigate to that particular template. All right, we're gonna cruise through this one here. And again, if I'm going too fast, please uh, let me know. All right, so this particular instruction is just to illustrate the use of case statement. So in this scenario, I'm assigning a value uh, to three, and then I'm testing my case statement, and the else 
will display the result for that scenario because my variable is not one nor two, so it's neither one and two, so my number is three. That's what you see on the screen here. That's an example of a switch statement, if you will, or case statement for that matter. We have some iteration flow here, uh, very similar to what we saw on the other page. Let me do this here a bit. Oh man, the editor is not helping me. So let's refresh the screen real quick. All right, so I have an array of strings and then I'm looping through the strings and I add a comma after that. So that's the result, then Ash, Raz, Victor. And then there is a, an additional comma here at the end. Um, on my for loop, I can use parameters. So in this example, I'm using uh, on, on this particular for loop, I'm saying, you know, look at the collection and then limit my loop to three uh, items in the for loop. So here's the result. So it's picking the first three here. I can also use offset. So in this example, I'm jumping to the third position of the array uh, and then starting to print after that third position. So everything starting from Victor forward is printed here. All right. Then I have another example called reverse. So in this example, I'm using two instructions. And, and that's what I, me I, I meant when I said the language is really handy when it comes to templating websites. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so I have an instruction called reverse. What it does is simply reverse the order of my array. So it will print Ambash, Omar, Scott, Victor, Raziash, and Danish first. But I'm also adding another instruction here called cycle. And what it does is, as I print my items on the screen, it's going to cycle through and then use those options as I print them. So this is what you see here. This variation is based on the cycle that I use. I mean, if you're working with, you know, active menus and collections that you want to display items in a different way, and if there is logic, so think about it when you use, you print a table on your website, you know, you want to show dark row, light row, dark row, light row, you can use cycle for that. I mean, I, I, in my opinion, it's fairly handy. Another thing that you see with uh, for loop um, instructions is that within the for loop, you have access to an object called for loop. And what it does is it allows for you to check whether or not your item is the first or last in the collection. So again, if you're uh, using liquid to expose JSON content, and if you want to spit out an array in that JSON content, if you want to maintain the structure of the array, this again comes in handy because you don't want to add an X or comma um, to, to that array if it if it's the last item and then therefore break the structure of the array. Um, so you can use the for loop object for that. And this is the result. For my first item, I added a bunch of stars and then I check to see if it was the last uh, and then I prevented adding the particular comma here at the end. Now, table row is supposed to be a for loop uh, that has a table, you know, the TR and TD HML embedded to it. This is part of the Microsoft documentation, but it's not working when you try to use that on a portal. So it's something that uh, I need to connect with the portal folks and let them know. But again, it's part of the Microsoft documentation, but the particular tag does not work. All right. And if it did, it is supposed to work this way. You declare a table. You add. You open your uh, your uh, HTML table tags here, and then by doing this, it would imply that uh, you were creating a tr and adding a particular um, a particular value to your table rows. All right. All right. Template tags. This is where the money is, if you will. These tags were created by Microsoft, I, I should say by ADX Studio at the time, um, to facilitate us implementing um, or exposing data from CDS to portals. In this scenario, 
I am I have a particular fetch XML here that's looking at a table an entity called accomplishments. This this particular entity uh, comes from the higher ed accelerator, and what I want to do is I want to look at the user that's logged on. Okay, using this user ID. Okay, let me explain. Let me expand my screen so that it's easy for us to to see it. So I want to look at accomplishments by this particular user, the user that's logged on. All right, I have columns here. I mean, plain fetch XML. Then uh, this is the way that you actually execute the query. All right. And when it's done, I have declared or I have uh, created this table, just plain HTML, and then I'm looking through the results of my fetch XML and then printing the results on the screen. You're going to see a few things here, and this is part of the Microsoft documentation itself. Um, because I'm looking at an option set, I have access to the option set label and also the value. Again, if you want to look at the value, you use value. If you want to look at the label, this is how you you'd see it. So let's have a look at the result set. So this is my list of accomplishment for the user that's logged on. The accomplishment here and then the type, which is um, the label for this particular option set. Now, there is another tag and we're going to see that in, in more detail uh, ahead of uh, in, in a few minutes. That's called include. The include tag allows for me to inject, if you will, another uh, liquid template within the template that I'm using. In this scenario, I am invoking, if you will, I'm going to use some technical terms that may uh, seem familiar to you just to facilitate the lecture. But what I'm doing here is I'm not using um, the contents of this particular web template and I'm passing parameters to my template. So this is the name of the variable or parameter within this particular template. And this is the value that I'm providing to it. So let's have a quick look at that template. So the name, what was that name? Uh, history. So I'm um, creating a fetch query and I'm assigning the results of that query to a variable called course history results. So if I switch back to the template we are looking at, you see that I'm using this include, I'm referencing the name of the, the template, passing the parameters, and then all the way down here, you see that I consult the results uh, that were uh, assigned to the particular variable that's created here. So course history results is not declared on this liquid tags template is declared here and populated here but i'm using that variable in my for loop and this this particular variable will be available all the way throughout this consuming template if you will this is usually the way i organize my fetch queries uh, if if they are reusable i always put them on a template so that I don't have to recreate these instructions. And if there are changes to it, I just change it in one place. So that's that's how I do it. Again, if I scroll down, you see the results for course history, the grades for this particular user, which is referenced here in this template. All right. So let's have a look at another template with a more complex query. So I have a query that has an inner join. I have results, uh, columns that are 
part of this secondary entity, but I'm assigning all the results to this variable called scholarship. Same, same way that we did the previous one, just a different template with a little bit more uh, color or details to, to my fetch, all right? So how do we display that information? So here I make a reference to the scholarship results variable and then down here you see that I'm referencing the alias that was used on my fetch XML and then the name of the field. All right, so again, if I go back to that template, you see that I use a inner join and then all the way to the side here, you see that I've established the alias for that entity and that's what I refer as my, uh, my result. All right, so moving on. Now, um, Liquid does not really provide a way for us to create methods in the, in the same way that uh, C Sharp or any other language would do, or functions if you think more on the JavaScript scenario. But there are interesting ways that you can set up your templates to act as if you, know, you, you have a function. And that's what we're going to see on this particular example here. So I have a template called liquid template method. Let's have a look at the instruction itself. So what this guy is doing is essentially I am querying dynamics to 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 uh, returns the return the result of scholarships associated with a particular student then i declare a variable set it to zero then i look through my collection and then i'm doing a sum of all the potential dollar amount associated with uh, scholarships that this student applied to so i mean i could do that using uh, aggregation in fetch but in this example, I just want to show this example on, on using plain, simple liquid to just aggregate a total amount. All right. So just looking through the collection, starting with my variable equals zero, then for every um, every record, I go ahead and I add the this particular field to my variable. All right. And then uh, on the page that consumes it, because I know the name of my variable, I can make use of that result in my HTML. Okay. It, again, if I move to the side, there is a filter here just to round the result, but I'm referring to the variable that was created in this particular template. So let's have a look at the result. So the total amount for this particular scholarship will be the sum of this guy. So 10, 13, 14 .5, 14, uh, $14,500 and, uh, $14, is the potential for this particular user. And then I can reuse this template throughout my application if I have to find the results for different users or to print this result in different pages. Again, not very well structured, uh, but you could still um, somehow, you know, uh, create methods or functions that or pieces of code that you can reuse uh, using uh, liquid all right moving forward I mean I'm really short on time so let me cruise through here uh, uh, Microsoft makes available uh, specific tags that pertains to CDS all right and this is very important for you to to dive into and learn more about these tags Edible tags will be used for content in your page that you want particular power users to be able to change. So as a, a website admin, when I hover over this particular area represented by this edible tag, I can make changes to the content using the front facing components. So page copy simple
So now I may change to content and all I did was adding this editable tag and then pointing to a particular field in the page object. You can do this with the other, other types of um, fields depending on which entity are being surfaced here on your page. Then uh, I, have, I have another editable tag that uses content snippet. This is the, the content of my snippet. And if I were to open uh, content snippets, you'd see that there as well. So let's, let's find the name of this thing. So the name is sample snippet. You see my content snippet here and the details. My super sample snippet. That's exactly what you see here. My super sample snippet pro unlimited power. So users, power users will be able to make changes. I think that the best scenario to use snippets is for content that you know that users will change often. Um, instead of you having a developer making the change, you can always use uh, save time of the developer by empowering your power users to, to make those changes for you. Then uh, moving on, the entity list tag. This actually refers to objects in your um, in your CDS application. Uh, I, I hope uh, most of the folks who are watching this, they are familiar with uh, entity lists, entity forms, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what it does is exposes Dynamics views to portals. So in my scenario here, I have an entity list that points to the account uh, table or entity, if you will, and I can define which uh, view, uh, CDS view, I wanted to expose, and it's using this college university entity list, all right? And in my template, I'm querying and displaying the total amount of records available. And then I loop through the results of that entity list and display the result as a table. So instead of me doing a fetch, I just refer to an existing dynamics view and I display the results here. So it saves me time. Again, if you know that you're gonna change or the users, the end users have a potential to um, the end users, by, by, by what I mean by that is like power users of CDS or sits and developers. If you know that sits and developers will change the filters of a particular query or view, instead of embedding your fetch XML on the template, you can do an entity view and then have the sits and developers manage the results uh, or the filters for those results, if you will. So again, going back to the website, you see my list of universities here and then the details on how many records existed there all right this is re uh, referencing the entity list you can also use an object called entity view they are very similar but the entity view allows me to refer to any entity in dynamics and any view that exists in dynamics without having a need to create a record for the entity list object. So in this scenario, I'm referring to the contact entity. Um, then I'm pointing to the active contacts view. And in here, I'm going to do an example uh, using a filter on my variable called batch. What it does is I look at the results and I'm batching the results in, uh, um, in, in, in four items per time. So I'm creating a batch of four results per cycle, if you will. So what it does is it's going to look through my batches and then I look to the contacts within that batch. Again, it, this comes uh, in handy for specific objects that you have a particular type of display that you want to display on your page. So I want to display the first four with a particular color or within a column. I want to display the next four a different way. So that's the way it works. So the result looks like this. So I'm displaying four items, then the next four items, and then whatever many are, are left after that. So if I had to use a particular programming language that 
it'll be a lot harder than just creating the batch. So this, I think it's really, really cool. So the last instruction that we're gonna look at in this particular CDS snippet is the uh, entity form, all right? On an entity form, I can point to a entity form that is created in Dynamics and just expose a form here on my page. And that's the form that you see here. It's a form from the account entity that has this particular fields set up. All right, so I have two more minutes. Let me cruise through and just show an example of a template and open four questions real quick. Um, this, this is a template I created using uh, both components from the Power Apps portal and then a little bit of liquid templating. Uh, templating. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is HTML, as you can see. But then down here, I have a reference to an entity form and then to a, a particular chart. So what this page looks like is this here. So that's my student panel. You see that it's only one template. And because I'm mixing uh, both the components that already exist in Dynamics, entity form, entity list, so on and so forth, I can create a template and say, depending on how this template is used, surface the entity form that I have associated with the page. So this is my entity form. And again, the same template, but now dynamically I'm exposing a list. And then I can click here again, another page with another grid, and then another page with another grid. But the template itself is the same, as you can see here. So the whole template is the same, and then I check for the page that I'm uh, using this template for. Is there an entity form? Yes, there is. What is the ID? You use it to present my information. And then, last but not least, the short tag. I'll save this here. I have a little bit of jQuery here. I'm going to clear my cache. And you see that you can expose charts from uh, CDS over on your web page form as well. All right, let me hop back to my presentation. I think we cover almost everything. So there are some other functions here depending on the, the types that you're using, date, add, hours, minutes, months, so on and so forth, some math, filters as well to facilitate calculation. There is no you know, variable plus variable. You have to use a filter to provide that functionality. Some filters for collection. We just saw the batch, but there are many others. Uh, URL also, if you want to find URL, you want to create a, a, a parameter um, to your request, so on and so forth. And I think that's it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah. over time. Yeah, yeah we, we don't have uh, much um, questions, Victor. We just have one question, one question uh, and I'm, that's the uh, that's a request actually. Okay. So, so Sarisa has uh, asked if she can share the templates uh, somehow with okay. with everybody. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. I have it saved. Uh, I'll see if we create a, a page somewhere with the this template so people can use. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, there were a couple of other questions that just came up. Uh, this is from Pavan, and the question is, can Power Apps Portal completely replace advanced customization possible using ASP.NET MVC? So it, it's a tough question. I mean, uh, at this moment, I would say no, uh, because we have a limitation in terms of uh, the uh, crude operations that you can perform on Power Apps Portal. Right now, you can only 
save, edit, or delete data using the the out of the box components. You know, uh, entity forms for that matter. That's the only way you can place data back into CDS. But I think you know, uh, in, by the end of June, I don't know the exact date, or maybe July. Microsoft is releasing the web API for portals. So, you know, creating, editing, and deleting records will be easier for us to do. So at that point, I'd say yeah, you can do pretty much anything using Power Apps portals. And, there were, go ahead. There were a few other questions, but I think we are already over time. Uh, so okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't want uh, can, to... If you can cough, I mean, I'll have a look at the questions offline and then reply to people directly. Um, yeah. Thank you, Victor. Uh, it was nice. Most of the functions even I didn't knew existed, so it was nice to have this session. Thank you, Victor. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, but uh, so now we are going to move on to uh, Benedict, uh, who is the P one of the PCF champions. He has been developing a lot of uh, controls on PCF 